Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining. We'll get started in just a minute. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar, Change Fatigue is Real, the first session in our Organizational Resilience webinar series. As we look back at 2020, a change intensive year, of course, and move into 2021, leaders are faced with the challenge of ensuring their people stay focused, engaged, and productive. It's more important than ever that organizations invest in strategies to deliberately manage change and move forward with purpose. Changing systems, data, processes, and more can create unexpected people-related challenges for organizations. Often overlooked is how organizations change and what to do about it. Deliberately managing the people side of change is key to success. We have a great session ahead led by AVAP Vice President, Dr. Shannon Sims. Dr. Sims has over 20 years consulting experience as an organizational psychologist focused on behavior change from simple process improvement to complex high profile transformations. She has a lot of war stories from almost all industries, including federal and state government, nonprofit, higher education and commercial sectors. So her advice and recommendations are rooted in a lot of practical experience. Before I hand it over to Shannon, I wanted to point out that if you have a question, feel free to submit at any time during the webinar and we'll be sure to answer them at the end. We will also be using Mentimeter polling today, so please have your phone or access to the internet handy. Lastly, an on-demand version of today's webinar will be available on our website in approximately two business days. Everyone who registered for this webinar will receive an email with a link to view the webinar on demand. We will also send a link to register for the rest of this webinar series. All right, so let's get started, Shannon. Vanessa, thank you so much for that introduction, and I'm so excited that um, you all have decided to join me here this, this afternoon. I think it's a, it continues to be a timely topic to talk about change fatigue, especially as we ended 2020, such a unique year. I know for me personally, um, January 1st, uh, New Year's Eve is my favorite holiday. It's, it's that, that kind of fresh start. Um, you, can, you can start 2021, can be anything you want, but in reality, right, it's just a continuation of, of the day before. And I think many of us are feeling that even here in 2021, that, that things are still kind of, um, they're a little tough, right? That we're, we're a, little, a little tired. Um, as as uh, Vanessa mentioned, I've got 20 years kind of working in this space as an organizational psychologist, but I spent the first part of my career working in behavioral health and counseling. And so I'm kind of bringing two different perspectives to our conversation today. And as I like to joke, the doctor's in, so please pull up your couch, pull up your chair, and let's just have a chat. My uh, two goals today, they're pretty straightforward. I really just want to kind of level set on um, kind of the mechanics that are going on you know, behind the scenes when we talk about change and change within organizations, maybe give you some insight that you haven't had before, or maybe share some reminders just to keep in the forefront of your mind. And the second thing I wanna do is just share some ideas on what you can do about it, both within your organization as and for yourself as an individual. So Vanessa, if we could move forward, please. I just wanna do a quick level set kind of on where where we are today, um, we're starting to see some studies coming out of industry and academia that are really starting to trend with the impact of COVID-19 and our ongoing response to the pandemic has had on individuals and um, both individually from a mental health perspective, but also within the work world. And um, a, co a coworker of mine, often says that uh, the word unprecedented was the word of the year for 2020. And I think that that is really um, appropriate. Um, but as we think about where we've been, um, the Society for HR Management you know, found recently in their study that 45% of the respondents, they're feeling emotionally drained from their work. 
41% of us are feeling burnt out from the work that we do, um, with 44% of folks kind of feeling like they're used up at the end of the day, that they don't really have much left that they can give, um, you know, within within their own, probably in their personal lives. And then 33% are feeling um, tired or that they have little energy and women are feeling this um, more significantly than men at 55, 56%. Right. I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of reasons why that's happening, but the end result, um, if you can move forward, if you can move forward, Vanessa, the end result is that we really um, have not been positioned well as individuals or organizations to adapt to the disruption that we've experienced over the last year. And we've never been here before. And what that means is we don't have a frame of reference. We don't have um, an experience in our past that we can pull on and learn from and you know, kind of apply, take the learning from what we did in the past and apply it to this new environment. Um, we've been in a reactive mode um, which I think is fine when you are in a kind of an immediate acute kind of situation. Um, but because our leaders have had limited experience to draw from, what it does is it increases that risk that, that we're going to stay in a reactive cycle of problem solving, right? So it becomes, our reactivity becomes chronic, and then it spills over into other, there's ripple effects across other decisions and other changes across the enterprise. And I think that that, that reactive kind of approach, it's just not sustainable. Um, it's understandable at the beginning of a situation, um, like at the exam, at the, for example, at the beginning of the pandemic, but it's really not a sustainable tactic to help us to continue to navigate and to continue to shift in this or uh, continue to work in our shifting work context, which could, you know, be a number of months in front of us. Um, so you don't need my validation if you can go forward, but what I'm really just trying to say is that change fatigue is real, right? We're tired. Um, we're tired of the change. The change that we are experiencing feels bigger, feels longer, sometimes feels like it's a little bit um, uh, maybe more than we can, more than we can handle. And every time that we are um, responding to new federal or state requirements, every time our organization introduces a new, um, new thing that we have to respond to, it really even just pushes our sense of normalcy out, um, you know, a good 60 to 90 to maybe 120 days. And we'll talk about, about why that is, right? But the reality, if you go to the next slide, the reality of our organizational change is that organizations actually don't change. It's the people within the organizations that change. And so organizations change one person at a time. And I wish I could say that was linear, but it's not. It's, it's really um, individual reactions are more like the roller coaster that we see on the left. I can wake up on a Tuesday morning and feel really hopeful about the way forward. And by Tuesday afternoon, you know, just feel like I've had, I've had more than I can take. Or by Friday, you know, I'm wondering if I'm in the, the right career. And then by Sunday, you know, after I've slept a little bit and things are, are going better, I can, I can feel hopeful again, right? So it's more like a roller coaster. Um, and as we think about our personal and our work lives, um, what may feel like a straightforward process change to us may have a different, you know, our colleagues and our coworkers may have a completely different emotional reaction to that. Something that we may feel like isn't that big of a deal may feel completely overwhelming. And the reason that that happens is really linked to three key things. It's aligned to our biology, it's aligned to our unique psychology, and then there's this influence of, uh, or this impact of social influence. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time just giving you some insight into those three, into those three areas. Let's start with biology. I think there's two, two key things to just kind of put in the back of your head. When it comes to biology, it's the chemistry in our brain and the influence of our hormones, um, and it's our brain structure. And when it comes to chemistry, um, our, when we're experiencing stress, our body interprets that sometimes as threat. And how it responds is it will produce cortisol. And cortisol is great. Cortisol is really super helpful. It helps trigger our fight or flight. It helps us to survive. The problem is if we have too much cortisol in our, in our head, um, it can start to impact our ability to make decisions. So things that used to feel simple 
now feel harder. Like, you know, what should I have for dinner? I, I joke that when I was finishing my dissertation, I just wanted a chicken sandwich and somebody asked me a very simple question about, did I want that like on a wheat bun or a white bun? And I broke down in tears, right? That, does, that simple decision felt so overwhelming. Um, and it was because my brain was swimming in cortisol, right? We have too much cortisol in our brain and just it can make easy things feel harder. Like, why do I have so many dishes and why do they always seem to be dirty? And that can feel overwhelming. Um, it can make remembering things difficult. Um, I, I personally, I think the last couple of weeks have been especially stressful and I have successfully forgotten most of the passwords to most of my accounts and have locked myself out, right? So those simple things are now, and now that makes it 9,000 times more difficult to, to do something simple like get somebody a document. Um, and it can also respond in atypical emotional reactions, um, often referred to as the bridezilla effect. When you see brides who are, you know, getting ready to get married and they're, they're having really atypical emotional reactions to things that are pretty straightforward, a lot of it has to do with, with the stress, right? But it also, we have, there's an impact um, on our brain structure. Um, nearly half of our behaviors are so deeply wired in our brain that we perform them automatically, right? So think about that. As you go about your day-to-day -day business, almost 50% of what you do is on autopilot. You're not really thinking about it. Um, and that leaves space for us to do our higher thinking, our higher reasoning, our higher problem solving. But as soon as we change something as simple as we were using Zoom yesterday and now we're using WebEx, just finding the login, I, I go back and forth between Zoom and Teams, and even just finding the share screen function, it's not habitual anymore, right? What used to be a habit, I now have to slow down and think about things. And because I now have to slow down and think about things, there is an impact on my productivity. There's this, there's a study by um, some MIT neuroscientists that they found that our prefrontal cortex, right? That's the part of our brain that really helps us to problem solve. It's the part of our brain that, that brings in the analysis and the critical thinking. It also is the part of our brain that um, makes the decision kind of automatically on what habits to switch on and off. So when we're going through organizational change, um, you change a process, you change the technology interface and you move the log on button from the left to the right. It forces us to slow down. And now we have to use that valuable prefrontal cortex to think about what do we do next? What's the next step? Um, and they, there, there's been some research to find that that type of task switching can lose us, you know, even if it's like a tenth of a second, that that compilation during a day can actually lose us up to 40% of our productivity. So the reality is if you are feeling like things are a little harder or you're feeling like even though you're online more hours that you're not at quite as productive, the reality is that's probably exactly what's happening, right? And, you know, to kind of compound this, as we think about what it takes to build a new habit, there's some research from um, the University College of London that says it takes on average 66 days of doing something consistently to turn a routine into a habit. And that can take up to 257 days, depending on how complex, or I'm sorry, 254 days, depending on how complex that routine is to, to create that as a habit. Right. So remember this as you, you know, are sitting in your next meeting or you're, you're, you know, trying to figure out like yesterday I felt was super productive today I'm not feeling productive. There may be something going on for you specific to um, just your workload and how your brain is wired and even how you're being asked to maybe learn un unlearn old habits and learn new habits and it hasn't taken you know have, haven't had the time yet to turn that into that routine into a habit. So biology is super important, but your psychology is also really important. And what I'm going to ask you to do, I'm going to ask you to pull out your smartphone or open up another uh, website and go to menti.com. Um, and the code you're going to enter is there at the top of the screen. It's 56979855. And I just want you to answer the question, when change happens to you, how do you feel? Not what do you think? but how do you feel? How do you react? And I think this is really, really important 
because our unique psychology um, really aligns us in how we're going to be predisposed to respond um, to change, um, how we're wired to interact with the people around us. Um, we're all naturally drawn to optimism or to realism, or frankly, some folks are just a little bit more glass half half full, more neg negative in how they're wired. Um, but we're all wired to emotionally respond to things differently, how we communicate, how we interpret, how we intuit, how we um, sense um, things that are going on around us. Um, so that when one person hears the news um, about a change, an organization's being acquired or a business unit's being divested, they can get super excited and respond with such hope and somebody else defaults to fear, right? And no two people are the same. So no two reactions are the same to a situation. And I think the key, piece, the key point for you as we think about the change that we're experiencing within our organizations is really twofold. One, give yourself some grace that how you responded to the change, and it's not static, right? Remember back to the roller coaster, how you responded yesterday and how you respond tomorrow, they may be very different. So give yourself some grace and some room to work through your change cycle, but give your coworkers grace. I know a couple weeks ago when, um, when the situation was happening with the Capitol, um, and I had been watching the news with a couple of folks who are actually on this call today, um, I, I went into, um, I couldn't process anything else. And then I had a meeting that afternoon and other people were completely nonplussed, right? It, it, and a lot of that has to do with our, our psychology. So give your coworkers grace if their reactions are different from how you are responding or how you are reacting. The third thing that I want us to just kind of touch on briefly is that there's a third factor that has a significant influence in how individuals respond to change within an organization and probably within just in general in within our lives. And that's about the social influence. Um, we've really become, I think, a Yelp nation where we now look to see what others have said about a product or a company or a travel destination or a restaurant before we kind of make our own opinion about that. And if other individuals are um, super supportive or very positive, that will have an influence over our response and our how we're feeling about or responding to the change that's in front of us. It's what makes the concept of a change agent network so, so powerful. There's some research in the technology adoption model that I think is applicable for all organizational change. And some of that research indicates that the number one mitigator of acceptance or resistance to new technology has to do with peer opinion, right? Um, and the more that we continue to see kind of uh, disengagement or some of the employee engagement um, research and work that shows that employees often question our leaders, right? But we're more inclined to listen to our peers. Our social influence, the social influence on um, organizational changes can have a pretty pretty substantial impact in how people are responding and reacting to change. So remember, our biology has an influence, our psychology has an influence, and our social network has a significant influence on, um, on change, right? So what do we do about it? What can we do about it? Um, we're not we're not kind of um, victims. We can, we, there's a lot of things that we can actually do about this, right? So that we can can start to grab hold of it, not continue to live in a change fatigue state. Let's move. Um, let's move forward. I think from an organizational perspective, if you have influence and control over resources or projects, one of the things that you can do is just being more deliberate in how you manage change, right? Being thoughtful, being purposeful, planning for that asking some of those questions up front, not waiting till the, till the solution is designed, but thinking about how the people who are gonna have to work differently, thinking about that up front. Um, ProSci, which is a global leader in uh, change management best practice research, they have consistently found over the, the last handful of years in their research that organizations who are more deliberate 
in managing change are six times more likely to achieve their project um, objectives, right? So that's over there on the far right. If you're kind of using an excellent change management um, approach, you're gonna be six times more likely to achieve your project um, objectives. But if you look over to the left, even the jump between kind of, I think of poor change management is we just wing it, or you know we we're reactive we deal with things when it when it comes up we hope for the best um even if you take a little bit of time and you're a little bit more planning right and you think about maybe your communications cadence or how are you going to deliberately train um, somebody to work a new way right that jump from poor to fair is pretty significant and if you look at that that jump from fair to good it's even more significant so my takeaway is the more deliberate you are you're increasing your likelihood of achieving your project results and you're, incre you're decreasing the risk that you're gonna overtax um, your people with, um, with kind of taking on too much. So that's one thing that you can do. I think another thing that you can do, um, kind of staying in the vein of ProSize research, um, there are a lot of mistakes that leaders and managers have made and we're sharing kind of the ProSize uh, top five findings for both leaders and managers. But I think the number one thing that you can do is not to underestimate the impact that the change that you're putting in, putting forward is going to have on the people. So Vanessa, if you can hit next, right? Don't underestimate. Leaders often underestimate or misunderstand what that people side of change is gonna look like. So spend time to really understand what the change impact is going to be. And managers often understand the team's ability to handle um, the change. I guess that's a good thing that our managers um, uh, you know, have such great confidence in, in the team. But if you have great confidence in your team, just pause for a second and just think, you know, I may have a super high performing team. That doesn't mean they can take on, um, that doesn't mean they can take on something new. You never know which one of those next things is going to be the straw that kind of breaks um, the, the, the back of our morale. So that's the second thing you can do is not to underestimate and be deliberate and be thoughtful in planning. The third thing that you can do from an organizational perspective is really just dig a little deeper to understand the impact. And we're going to offer kind of three, three tactics um, for you to think about. Um, I'm often asked, can you, can you measure change fatigue? And the answer is absolutely. We actually have an approach to do that, to, to take kind of take a look at a temperature gauge, a, a point in time, kind of a, cli a climate uh, uh, check, so to speak, to see what's the change fatigue of an organization right now. But we also can look at organizational resilience, which is a longer term um, view, kind of thinking when I think about like a health check, when you go to the doctor, they will um, take your temperature, that's more the climate check, and then they, maybe you'll do some blood work and that gives you kind of a, a bigger indicator of your long term health. Um, so change fatigue, climate check can help right now. What, what is the climate right now? Helps with near term actions. An organizational resilience kind of a capability assessment helps you do some long term planning. And how do you deliberately build um, or organizational resilience so that the organization and the individuals are more adaptive to change. I think another thing that you can do is really take a pause and understand the portfolio, the portfolio of the changes that are in front of you and, um, and how those might impact um, your people. And then to use that in conversations with um, uh, either with the team or with your leaders just to make decisions on timing and how you introduce new changes. Um, I was working with an organization and they were just really dead set on getting something done at the end of the, the fiscal year because they, they just wanted it off their plate. But when we started looking at um, the changes that were going on across the enterprise and, and some of the negative impacts from a revenue perspective, it really was wise to delay um, and to push that that new thing off to the to the first quarter of the next calendar year um, to give the employees kind of a breathing room. And I think the third thing is to remember that if you use a change management framework to guide um, your approach to change, that it will really help you to be more deliberate and just pick one. Um, there are hundreds to, you know, an in industry to choose from. Pick one and um, adapt it or create one within your organization and, and just use it as you, uh, as you can to be purposeful about how you roll out and introduce new changes to the organization. And so those are things that you can do 
I think from an organizational perspective, but I want to pause and just talk about you for a second. This is where, where the, the, um, the former counselor comes in. Um, as you know, I kind of mentioned that organizations change and they change one person at a time. Um, you're, you're an individual first before you're an employee. Um, you're a family member first before you're an employee. You're an employee first before you're a manager. You're probably a manager first before you're a leader. And really take the time to think about you first. And I know that it can feel like our days are so full and we don't have time for that. But there's, there's that old... Um, I don't know if it's an analogy or a story or example that, you know, if you have a thimble of energy and um, goodness to kind of spread around, if you pour that thimble out and there's nothing refilling it, then you don't you have like this finite amount of impact. But if you kind of think about you're a pitcher and you're letting that energy fill the pitcher, then you kind of let all that goodness overflow from your spending the time to re-energize your own batteries. So definitely, you know, prioritize yourself, take time for yourself. Um, I know a couple of weeks ago um, I had to, I, I made a decision to, to take lunch. Um, I felt guilty the whole drive to my lunch. I felt guilty for the first 10 minutes I sat and I just took a little bit of time and read a book. And I felt completely re-energized that when I came back for the second part of my day, I was actually able to be more present, more thoughtful in the conversations I had with, with my team members and my various projects, right? So that that is that is valuable to make time for you. Um, disconnect from technology. I know it can be hard. Um, I turned my phone um, off vibrate so that it wasn't constantly interrupting me. And I found myself breathing a little, a little bit um, easier. So give yourself that kind of space that it's okay, even if it's just 10 minutes or 15 minutes to disconnect. Um, striving for balance, I know is always kind of a joke, but because um, who says that, you know, really can we, we strive for balance, maybe strive more for integration or kind of taking a look at your day and how, how you're spending time and, and setting boundaries for the things that are important. And really, I think the last two are so, so important. Get some sleep. Um, the sleep rejuvenates our serotonin. Serotonin helps our brain regenerate. Serotonin helps us to combat the, the excess cortisol in our brain. Serotonin is so, so important. Sleep helps us to do that. And then laugh. Laughter, deep, deep. There's a lot of research on deep belly laughs, um, enjoyment, things that are amusing, um, spending time with people that um, bring us a sense of fulfillment. Um, it's the number one way to combat cortisol. Um, I have uh, Big Bang Theory. It is one of the funniest things, on, in my opinion, on the planet. And in the evening, instead of watching the news now, which causes me great angst and anxiety, I now have Big Bang Theory on repeat. And I'm now up, back up to season eight. And so I watch a couple episodes. I, I find myself rejuvenated through the laughter. So I, I ask Bazinga, thank you so much. Exactly. Not bazooka, it's bazinga. Um, so watch, you know, find something that's going to give you um, a little bit of humor, take a break, whether it's a walk um, or, or find something that brings you um, enjoyment. And so my last poll um, that I'm going to ask you is I'm really just going to ask you to commit to which of these five things are you going to do for yourself over the next week? making time for yourself just and you can select more than one disconnecting from technology striving for a little bit more of work-life balance getting some sleep taking a nap laughing which of these things are you going to commit to because there's something about when you actually take a second to commit to it it it, it connects it in our memory and um, also kind of can give you some permission that you're going to prioritize in this in your life um, over the coming weeks so a lot of folks I see are making time for themselves. I see a lot of folks committing to getting some sleep. I agree. Um, it is so, so important. Um, laughing, laughing, it is the best medicine. All right, so I thank you. Um, my, my key takeaways for you guys, um, as you head out before we open it up for questions, um, really is, um, if you can go to the next slide, Vanessa, um, kind of keep the reason for your change in front of you. 
Um, keep that in the forefront of your mind and for communication. Um, really just remember people are unique. I know we all know that. Um, just, but just remember, especially when we get into the pressure cooker of projects, um, things can, can, you know, it's easy to get annoyed. It's easy to, to forget that we all respond differently. Um, uh, things can, people's responses can be unpredictable. We don't know who just lost an argument with their five-year-old. We don't know whose significant other just, you know, maybe was laid off. We don't know who has a family member that maybe was just hospitalized, right? So have some grace, be prepared for the unpredictable. Be deliberate in how you manage um, change. It's gonna increase your likelihood for success and then take some time for yourself. Um, and if you have anything specific on a project that you wanna talk about, uh, definitely connect with me on LinkedIn or send me an email. Happy to, to, to grab some whiteboarding or brainstorming time with you. So with that, I'm going to just pause and see if um, if anybody has any comments or questions, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Vanessa to kind of facilitate that. Great. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was such a great session. Um, always super helpful to hear those tips. Um, so a few questions did come in for you throughout the presentation, but just want to remind everyone that um, if you have a question, feel free to send it in through the Q&A box or just the chat feature. Um, so this person asked, how should managers start a discussion with leadership about change fatigue when they notice it in their direct reports? Uh, such a, so, such a, a great question and so, so, so relevant, I think, for so many of our organizations. Um, you know, I think from my perspective, most leaders, they appreciate a candid, a candid conversation. And um, I, my, my best recommendation would just be to, you know, maybe schedule a 30 minute check in um, just to share some observations and just to candidly share, um, protect the anonymity if somebody has said something specific. But if you are noticing um, people are really late to meetings, if you're noticing people saying things like I'm just overwhelmed or I'm stressed, um, just share those those observations that, you know, we may be maybe kind of living in a change fatigue and environment and um, kind of bring some ideas forward on things to to help with that. And there are there are a lot of lot of things from just humanizing meetings, right? Um, a coworker of mine was saying that she was noticing she's a real diehard extrovert. She was noticing that all of her meetings, there's no chit chat and she really misses that, you know, when she was sitting in the client space, you know, when you're sitting in a conference room for the couple minutes um, before a meeting starts or the couple minutes after, you know, the hallway conversation that you just talk about life and, and things. And so, you know, even being able to kind of start off a meeting, um, just kind of talking about life as opposed to just jumping in, sometimes that can help. But I'd say the best way to start that, that conversation is just to, you know, have a check in with, with your manager and share what you're observing. And if you have any ideas, I think, um, as, as a leader, when my when my team members um, bring me concerns, I always appreciate when they bring me um, ideas and solutions to help address that. So, um, and if you have something specific that you wanna talk through, or if you have specific concerns, or you've tried that in the past, by all means, please email me and um, we can talk through your, your unique situation and talk about you know, what, what can you do to, to start that conversation. Great, thank you, Shannon. Um, the next person would like to know, what is one action item leaders can start doing today that will help alleviate change fatigue in their team? Oh, outstanding. Um, oh, gosh, because leaders have such, they have such um, an influence, right? Like leaders are the ones who role model the behaviors that, um, that, uh, employees then model, right? So if, if a leader says one thing, but then they do something else, people will follow the behavior. I think there's a couple things that leaders can practically start doing. One, um, pay attention to when you're sending emails and when you're responding to emails. If you have a habit of responding to emails at 10 or 11 p.m. at night, set, the, set that response to go out uh, in core work hours, because your your people are paying attention to things like that. And if you're online all hours of the night, they're going to start to feel like they need to be accessible at all hours of the night as well, right? So that's that's one practical thing that you can do. Um, another thing that you, another practical action that you could start doing is um, uh, maybe even just have you know, non 
non-meeting specific coffee chats or check-ins um, where you bring folks together, whether it's a virtual happy hour or bring in um, you know, a, something that is a fun element. My niece works for an organization that, that their manager was really concerned that they were starting to experience some significant fatigue. And every Friday they now play trivia and they just do it as a team for some team building. They have a running, um, and I love this idea, they have a running, um, uh, running score and at the end of the month, whoever has the highest score from trivia, right, they get like a $25 gift card. Um, so I think that as a leader, right, just pausing and take taking stock of do your words match your behaviors and, you know, thinking about what do your behaviors convey to your people, right, because those experiences, you will create the experiences and if they're change fatigued, what are the thinking about the specific things you can do to start to kind of alleviate that pressure for them. Awesome. Thank you. And then this looks like this is the last question that has come in. But once again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to send them in um, or definitely feel free to reach out um, to Shannon via email or LinkedIn. So this question says, it's so important to take time for yourself but how do you get over feeling guilty taking just an hour for lunch? <laughs> well, you build a habit and um, you force yourself to do it. I think it's like anything else. Um, um, I, I'm trying to at least once a week make that a habit to, to take lunch for myself. And the guilt is, is right there, right? And um, the first couple of minutes, I'm just kind of breathing. Like if I'm not doing this, then I'm... I'm of no value to my my coworkers in the afternoon if if I if I don't take that that brain break. Um, my my best my best recommendation is sometimes you just kind of like working out, right? Or changing your diet, you just have to do it and make it a habit. Um, one of the things that I have a client that I really appreciate what she has done. Um, she has actually blocked off her lunch hour so nobody can schedule. Um, meetings over top of that. She has communicated, right? And just even because she is, she's a leader in the organization, even that communication to her team, right? That she will be not available from noon to one. Um, that that even sets an expectation that it's okay, right? Like that it's acceptable to, to take that, to take that breather. So I would say block it on your calendar, right? And if you, if people can read your calendar, and you don't want them to see personal lunch, make it an appointment with somebody else, right? You have an appointment with Joe, you have an appointment with Sally um, and, you know, and then disconnect and take it and do what you need to do, whether that's, I have a coworker who gets, you know, gets on the bike, um, but making that time for you is super, super important. And if an hour feels too long, make it a half hour, but I think sometimes we just have to make ourselves do it and then the guilt will go away over time. Definitely. Great. Thanks, Shannon. And we did have one more question come in. Um, so how do you recommend organizations handle introducing changes while staff are managing heavy workloads and anxiety might be running high? Yeah. Yeah. I think um, it's so, yeah, it, it is. Uh, that, that describes, I think, most of our organizations right now. I think some of the, the best ways to do that, most organizations have kind of regular meeting cadences that are already set up. Um, and I, I, I do think that there is, at times, there's a triple effect, right? And starting with the leaders, um, if there's a new change that's coming, whoever's sponsoring that change, making sure that they are engaging um, the leaders across that organization, whether it's a business unit, um, uh, an entire organization that they they are giving that those leaders time to kind of digest it, right? And by time I mean, don't roll it out to a leader on a Monday and then go talk to the managers on a Tuesday because you're going to talk to the employees on Wednesday. Give them time to digest it. Um, give them a week, right? So build some extra time into your timeline because your leaders are gonna to have to be the ones who are gonna to have to advocate and they're gonna be the ones who are going to field the questions. So when you roll it out, when you talk to them about it, make sure that you are providing the context, give them tools, maybe FAQs, um, give them time to ask their questions, use their questions 
to refine your tools, then move on to the managers and spend more time with the managers than you would with any other organization or any other group in the organization. Your managers are, and I see a couple of folks here on the, on the call that um, have been on client projects with me, your managers are at the bottom of the fun curve. They're getting all the expectations pushed down to them from leaders and they're getting all the questions and the anxiety pushed out from their people. And your managers still have a day job to manage, right? So give them extra time, give them extra space, set up, set up small group conversations with them. Um, make sure you have the tools, make sure you give them time to digest what it is that, that you're rolling out. Um, use their responses, um, their questions to refine um, your message and how you roll it out to, to the employees. But I would get your leaders and your managers aligned first before you introduce it to the employees. That way um, your employees will feel like they've got a support network when they are um, kind of working through their, their change cycle. I would also say that if you have a project management office or if you have some type of organization that's monitoring um, new, new changes that you kind of take a look at the impact of that change compared to everything else that's going on just to do a gut check on timing. Um, because timing, timing can be everything. Um, so hopefully that is, hopefully that is helpful. Great. Thanks, Shannon. Looks like that was all of the um, questions that came in. All right. So um, this is the first, uh, this is a repeat performance today of a session we did in December, and it really kicks off our focus on uh, strengthening our uh, resilience. So we have a session next Wednesday to talk about strengthening organizational resilience and a session the following Wednesday on February 10th to talk about personal resilience. And my colleague, Mark Dillard, who is a 25 year um, veteran in the org development and leadership coaching space is gonna be sharing um, some very practical uh, perspective on um, how organizations can uh, think about strengthening organizational resilience and then really as an individual thinking about personal resilience and how we learn um, from past situations so that we cannot just cope and survive the changes that are in front of us, but also kind of to bounce forward and, and to learn and to grow through those. So please join us. Um, this deck will go out um, in a PDF format. You can register for the rest of the series through, through that. Um, or I believe we also have, um, Vanessa will be sending, sending that registration link um, as part of the follow-up to today's session. So I thank you. I thank you for your time. Again, if uh, you want to have a conversation uh, about anything going on in your organization, please feel free to reach out. Happy to grab some time with you. Thank you so much. I hope that you have a great rest to your Wednesday afternoon. Great. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you, everyone, so much for joining. Uh, we hope to see you next Wednesday.